popular photo storage service, MyOli, predicted that in 2017, the human race will take enough photos that if printed in four by six inch photographs and laid out side by side, the distance that that would cover would be equivalent to two and a half round trips from here to the sun. Now that is a lot of photos. So through a quick raise of hands, please, who's like guilty of adding to that distance frequently? Yeah, most of you are. And as you know, we're taking photos across multiple devices, multiple platforms, but it doesn't mean that our photos are always good. Hi, my name is Ian. Hi, I'm McKenna. I'm Christian. I'm Maribel. And I'm Carmen. And together, we're here to present to you the five most important things in taking a better photo. This is what we'll be going over today. Now, the first one of those things is background. As a photographer, it is incredibly important for you to take the time to realize what you're taking a picture of. You can think of background as having a voice. It is meant to enhance a photo instead of distract, and it is there to help you convey a certain meaning. You can also think of background in its entirety. As a whole, your background can tell a story, and as you'll learn later, what you decide to exclude is just as important as what you decide to include in a photo. Now, to understand these processes, please take a look at this example. Here we seem to have a person that is standing in front of so something, posing, but there's no really a story to be told. You don't know what this photograph is. The background behind her is empty and there's random buildings. You don't really understand what this photo is. Therefore, this is not a proper application of background. In order to avoid this problem, you can always ask your subject what it is that they want behind them as the background. However, for those that are shy, you can always place yourself as the, su as the subject and think of yourself in that person's shoes and say, hey, if I'm standing at this uh, place for a moment, what is it that I want the person to take the picture of? After all, you don't go to the Eiffel Tower and ask somebody to take a picture of you for them not to include it behind you. Now, please take a look at these next pictures and try to think of what you just learned about background. On its own, the Eiffel Tower can tell many stories. Hey, this is Paris, it's the city of love, whatever. But as part of this photograph, it helps convey a meaning of peacefulness and happiness as reflected in the family's faces. But when you think of background in its entirety, you'll see that the Eiffel Tower is not pictured as a whole. And that, if you remember, is because what you leave out on a photo is just as important as what you leave in. And that's exactly what it means to frame a photo. In a literal sense, framing a photo means getting your alignment right. All your lines have to be straight, both vertically and horizontally, and everything has to fit within a certain frame of your photo. But framing is also important because it gives you, as a photographer, power to create your scene. You now have the choice to decide where the picture starts, where it ends, what's in it, and what, what's not in it, and all of these uh, can have different impacts on your photo. So let's take a look at this photograph again. As you can see, everything is straight. The Eiffel Tower is nice and vertical, it's straight, there's parallels between the girl's arms and the middle part of the Eiffel Tower. And if you think about what the person taking the photograph has decided to leave out, that's the top part of the Eiffel Tower. That's because if he or she decided to include that within the photograph, it would have placed way too much distance between her and the subject. Therefore, it would have distracted in the photo, and by using these proper framing techniques, <laughs> she was able to draw focus again to the family, and the family remains as a story to be told in this photograph. Now we'll pass it on to McKenna. Thanks. I am going to talk to you a little bit about lighting. Uh, lighting is an important component of a photo. It adds character and tone. It can make a photograph dramatic, personal, or professional, depending on how you would like to light it. There are two types of lighting. Uh, the first one is natural lighting, which simply put is light from the sun. And then there's artificial lighting, which is light that you can manipulate and change to suit different needs. It is important that you have a good understanding of both of them so you can uh, light a photograph a proper way, no matter where or when you might be taking a photo. With natural lighting, you do not have control of it, so it's important to intentionally choose your time and place of when you want to take your photograph. Weather can make or break a photo. Uh, for example, in the photo uh, on the slide here, they're taking taking a photo during sunset, and the sun is facing towards the camera, creating sun rays. Normally, you don't want those sun rays there because it can make the photo look washed out and ruin the composition of the photo itself. Uh, it was an intentional artistic choice in the slide here, and uh, it's just an example of how you and possibly use the sun to your advantage. Um, there are 
there are two opportunities that are best to take photos in uh, with natural lighting, and that is right after sunrise and right before sunset. These are typically called the golden hours, and it creates a warm, golden light to take photos in. It's uh, good for portraits um, and taking pictures of subjects that may or may not be alive, such as the horse and the carriage here, both create a nice shadow. Um, artificial lighting um, is more common than natural lighting just because it's used more often. The most common type of flash, or the most common type of artificial lighting is flash, which we'll talk about a little bit later. A uh, common misconception about artificial lighting is that it's very expensive to have a lighting setup, um, but it's very, very easy to do it yourself as well. All you really need is a lamp to move around and manipulate to get the best lighting for your photo. Uh, professional setups are typically used for commercial and professional setups, uh, such as a commercial magazine ads or uh, professional portraits. And I'm going to hand it off to Christian to talk about the basics of a smartphone camera. All right. So most of you raised your hands and said that you do use, uh, you know, your phones to take pictures on a pretty regular basis. Um, cell phones have come a long way in their camera departments. There, they can take very, very clear pictures these days. But there are still a few limitations when compared to a traditional camera. And I'm going to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses and some of the ways that you can kind of get the most out of your cell phone camera. First thing you can do is turn on what are called grid lines, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It uh, turns on some grids and lines on your cell phone screen when you start to take a picture, and this is on pretty much any camera app that you have out there. And what this does is it allows you to easier frame your photo. As Ian talked about, framing is incredibly important. Um, on the previous photo we saw, there was a ballerina off to the far right of the photo, and what that uh, photographer was using is called the rule of thirds. And it's just one of the ways that photographers use geometry to create these scenes. Uh, the rule of thirds is essentially you want to have your subject in one third of the photo and use the other two thirds as sort of a background or to tell some kind of story or convey a mood. Having these grid lines on not only allows you to better easily figure out where those thirds are, but also if you want to just center your photo, it gives you a perfect center screen for that. Uh, the next thing is zoom. In short, don't ever, ever use zoom on a cell phone. Uh, cell phones are incredibly thin, and the way that traditional camera zooms work, it's exactly like a magnifying glass. You have a stationary lens and a mobile lens, and moving that mobile lens back and forth <coughs> either increases or decreases the size of whatever you're looking at. Same with the magnifying glass. If you hold it out in front of you, move it back and forth, things get bigger, things get smaller. Fortunately, with cell phones, they only have the stationary lens. So if you start taking a picture and you do the pinch to zoom during the photo, all you end up doing is actually reducing the image quality of what you're looking at. You're not actually changing what the optical sensor on the camera sees. So if you want to take, you know, crop out a certain area of the picture or zoom in on a certain area, take the picture first, zoom afterwards. If you don't like it, you still have the full quality picture that you can look at as reference or, you know, whatever you want to do with that picture. Uh, the next thing is to use flash sparingly. McKenna talked a lot about lighting. It is very, very important. Uh, flash is one of those things that it's situationally useful. Natural lighting is usually what photographers go for. That's why they spend tens of thousands of dollars on artificial lighting, is so that they can attempt to recreate natural lighting. Flashes on cell phones especially emit a very blue-white light. It's very not natural. It's very hard to capture a natural setting when you use the in some instances, you're going to have to use the flash if it's too dark, but cell phones have come a long way and are starting to take better pictures in darker environments, so you don't necessarily have to use it. Personally, I would recommend taking a few with the flash, a few without. If the artificial look is what you're going for, that's totally fine. Uh, finally, HDR is a setting on pretty much all the cameras in general. HDR stands for High Dynamic Range. What High Dynamic Range does is it really draws out the contrast between different colors and different hues of the same color. For example, if you take a picture of a rose garden, if you have HDR off, you're just going to sort of see a sea of red and green stems, right? With HDR on, it's going to draw out those very subtle differences between each rose petal. You're going to see the darker reds, the lighter reds. The, the green is going to really pop out. It's kind of the difference between a photo you post on Facebook and something that could get posted on a postcard. 
Uh, almost all those photos use HDR or something to that extent to really saturate those colors and make them incredibly vibrant. However, it's for that very reason that you should never, ever take a picture of someone's face with HDR on. HDR will almost always show up as a setting while it's on that says HDR, HDR plus. It's very easy to turn off. But when you turn it on and take a picture of someone's face, because it's so good at pulling out contrasts, you're going to be pulling out all of the unflattering things about an individual's face. So if they have differences in skin tone, if they've got a pimple, if they've got you know anything going on that they don't want to see, the HDR is going to magnify that. It's it's like the equivalent of looking at yourself in a mirror under fluorescent light. You're looking ah no that's mm. it, it's the same thing with HDR. So use HDR for things or places, but not faces. So I'm going <laughs> to hand it off to Mirabel to talk a little bit about the different cell phone apps. Yes, yeah, so now we're going to discuss some of the ways that you can upload, share, and edit some of the pictures that you have taken. Um, so when we surveyed the class, some of the questions that we asked were, how much of a photography expert do you consider yourself, and do you own a professional camera? A lot of you said that you consider yourself to either be advanced beginners or novice, and more than half of the class said that you do not own a professional camera. With this in mind, we have selected three different apps to, that can cater to your expert level, that are free and available on both ISO and Android um, that can help you edit the picture. The first one that we're gonna discuss is Instagram. So this is more for our beginners. Um, Instagram is very user friendly. It has a, lot of, um, it has a lot of features that can help you edit your pictures a lot easier. Uh, it has a lot of filters that are very subtle and some of that are very dramatic. So depending on what you want to focus on, you can pick and select whatever filter you would like to use. Um, some of the tools that Instagram offers are changing in brightness or contrast. Um, so very simple tools. It's definitely not the best uh, app to use uh, to edit your pictures, but it's definitely somewhere to begin so that you can get familiar with the different tools and how they change your image. The second one that we we'll talk about is Visco. This is actually my personal favorite. Um, Visco is more for our advanced uh, people who need a little bit more tools and want to play more around with the effects of their pictures. Uh, Visco is also very user friendly and can help you get more detailed editing than Instagram. So Visco uh, works one or two ways. You can either use the apps, I mean use the filters that are already in the app when you download it or you can also buy extra ones. So depending on what you want your to focus on, there, uh, Visco offers different variety of filter apps that can help you uh, edit your picture better. Uh, most of the apps, I mean, I'm sorry, most of the packages range from 99 cents to 2.99, so they're not that expensive, but definitely not something that you want to, you know, waste your money on. Um, some of the tools, some of the best tools that Visco offers are the change in perspectives for your image, you're changing the skin tone, and changing the tone and the grain of your photo. Uh, Visco does this really cool thing, similar to what Instagram does. Um, they have a platform called The Collection where you can share the pictures that you've edited um, with other professionals in your community. This is definitely not the place for you to like upload your picture of you and your friends like on a Thursday night, but it's definitely somewhere where you can share your really nice pictures. And then third, we will talk about Snapseed. So this is a lot, uh, a lot more difficult um, and more advanced than the other two apps. And Snapseed actually won App of the Year in 2011, so it's a really, really great app that you can use to edit your photos. Um, Snapseed has similar tools to what Instagram and Visco have, but they also work on a layering system, kind of like Photoshop. So you can go back and edit or delete any other changes that you've made, and uh, you can see those changes. Um, some of the greatest tools that Snapseed has is what is called the the brush and the healing tool. The healing tool allows you to delete parts of your pictures that you don't want. So for example, if you're taking a picture with your family and someone decides to photobomb you, and you're like, wow, this could have been such a great picture except this goofy person, and you're kind of ruined it, then you can go on Snapseed and use the healing tool to delete that person. So that's super cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so like I said, Snapseed allows you to the changes that you've made in all your pictures through that layering system. Um, so it's a lot more difficult, but it's definitely a really, really good app to use when editing your pictures. And now we'll hand it over to Carmen. So I want to talk about better management of your photos because we're busy clicking and sharing them on social media, 
but I ran into an article online by a photographer that stated, his title of his article was, the most uh, photographed generation will have no pictures in 10 years. And basically what he was saying was that, back in the day we actually had to buy a roll of film and you were limited to the number of photos that you could take, up to 24, 32 photos. So you actually focused on taking better quality photos and didn't waste it just snapping away, right? <coughs> Then you also had to take it in to get it developed. And so we actually collected prints and made photo albums. And then you could go back to your sister's wedding photo album and you knew where that picture was, or your brother's football photo album and you knew where to find those pictures. Today we're busy sharing them on social media so much. If I asked you to find a picture from last year, one of important event from last year, you're probably going to look through your Facebook or through your mom's Facebook or through your old phone that's sitting in a drawer at home. So I just want to share with you three different options for backing up and managing your photos. So the first one I want to talk about is internal backup, and this one is for easy access. This is like your laptop. So with consider when you're considering backing up on your laptop, you just want to do a few photos at a time. You don't want to take the 10,000 photos that you have on your phone right now and download them to your laptop. Now I understand that your laptop could probably manage that because they have larger capacities nowadays, but you want to take 10 to 15 photos, upload them to your laptop, and then when you're working on your pop for this semester, for this class, then you know where to find your photos. So a limited number of photos and short-term storage, and also for easy access for current projects, right? Now the second one that I want to talk to you is about external backup. This is the most recommended by most articles out there today. Um, and so many of you are like external hard drives. I don't really use those anymore, but it is recommended. And the cool thing is that you can have a portable one or a standalone to, to keep at home. The good thing about these is that they're more affordable and have larger capacity. So you could technically download your 10,000 photos from your phone today and plug it right in. Another cool thing is that obviously they're updated with technology and they have apps so that you can put them on your phone and you can upload your photos instantly and delete them as you need them. <clears throat> and then some of them are automatic backups. So they'll automatically back them up, almost like your cloud. So some of you are <coughs> like, I'm already using the cloud, I'm not gonna use that. Now the third um, most recommended and most popular service is obviously your online services. So many of you may be familiar with Google Photos, um, Dropbox, or now Amazon Prime has uh, Amazon Photos. And then clicker. The thing to consider with these is that you want to think about the limit capacity that you want, how many photos you want to store, and if you're willing to pay, because some of them are free and some of them do charge you. And um, access. Most of them do have an app that you can download to your iPhone, and that way you can back up your photos instantly as well. So like um, Google Photos has 15 gigabytes of storage for free, if you want to leave your photo in its original format. Now, if you shrink it down to a certain format, they'll give you unlimited photo storage. Um, if you decide that you want to increase your storage, then it's going to be like $10 a month for one terabyte. Flickr already has one terabyte of free, uh, free storage. And then your Amazon Prime, I wouldn't say it's unlimited and free because you're paying for your membership, uh, Prime membership to have access to use the Amazon. Now my personal favorite is Shutterfly, and that is because with Shutterfly, I have the app on my phone, I download the photos, it comes up with a big OS on top of the photos that I've already backed up, so I know which photos I can delete, and then it also allows me to create my folders as I'm backing them up to my app. And another cool thing, since I am old fashioned, is I like to order prints, so I can order prints, or I can order photo books, or other gifts for family members such as the calendars or copy mugs and stuff like that. So one last step when organizing your photos. <coughs> Obviously you want to um, go back and sort through them, right? So you took 10, 10 selfie shots and you uploaded five of them. You want to go back and delete and keep at least two. So you don't want to keep multiple duplicates for no reason. You're backing them up and sorting through them and keeping the best quality photos. Next, you want to rename your photo by the person, the name, or the event that's going on in that photo. And then last, you want to um, create your folders. So one example would be like creating a main folder that says 2016, 
and then break, making subfolders that say it's holidays and vacation so that you know which folder to actually go to. Next slide. And these are the five tips that we wanted to share with you so that you can capture that special moment and store it in a safe place so that you can share with your family and friends in the future. And we'll open up the floor for questions. <laughs> 